got your uh, song sheet here. We're going to be singing when I step off on that beautiful stool. We're talking about when we get to heaven. Jesus told Mary, uh, told Martha, she was cumbered about much serving. 
She was stressed out over much serving, and it was affecting her walk with God. Listen, the devil can and will use distractions to literally run you right into the ground. You'll find yourself going in five different directions, and it begins to take a toll on you. Burnout will make you weary. Some folks just don't know how to relax. They don't know how to slow down, and they, they don't have an off switch. And after a while, they begin to wear out. Some suffer nervous breakdowns. Others suffer physical exhaustion. And some find themselves just, just flat out running on empty. Whatever the case, the bottom line is, we're of no use to anyone, especially God, if we allow ourselves to burn out. Uh, a few weeks ago in Sunday school, we were looking at Moses, who was burning out. His father Jethro says, what you're doing is not good. Because from the time he got up to the dark, he would hear the people's problems. Every petty little argument he had to give judgment on. Jethro said, you need to delegate some responsibility, and he did. And it probably kept Moses from burning out. Number three, being in the flesh will cause you to be weary. Sometimes the trials of life will get you down and cause you to fall into a depression. And let me just add, it's not a good idea to make decisions when you're exhausted, when you're depressed, when you're sick, when you're angry, because they're usually the wrong decisions. There are times we need to make ourselves be still. Be still and know God. Being in constant motion will sometimes drown out the voice of God. We need to set aside some quiet time, early in the morning, late at night usually, where you can just be still. Don't ask God for nothing. Just listen to Him speak to your heart. Being in the flesh can wear you out. There's an expression that's called burning the candle at both ends. And it's talking about literally living a double life. When you truly give your life to God, it's a full-time commitment, which is a good thing. Because as they say, an idle mind is the devil's workshop. And most of us get ourselves in trouble when we got too much time on our hands. However, those who try to keep a foot in both worlds, it's like they're serving two masters and it can't be done. No man can serve two masters. If you're living for God on Sunday and then living like the devil the rest of the week, it will take its toll on you. That's burning the candle at both ends. Those are just a few of the things that have the potential to make us weary. Having looked at those things that cause us to be weary, let's look at the spiritual connection. When Christians become weary in well-doing, the fact that it mentions well-doing talks about our work for the Lord, our service for the King. What are some of the things that can cause us to be weary in well-doing? Being used by people. That'll get you down sometimes. Being taken advantage of. Doing for others without so much as a thank you. Now, we're doing it for the Lord. But sometimes our flesh gets offended when, when it feels like everybody and his brother's calling us up and, and just, you're going and going and it just feels like you're just wearing out for God that way. Number two, being overwhelmed by darkness can make you weary and well-doing. We are called to be shining lights in this world of darkness. But there are times when it feels like our light is being swallowed up by a black hole of darkness that is this world. Because of all the wickedness and ungodliness in the world, it sometimes feels like we're fighting a losing battle. We go about doing good with little to show for our efforts. We devote our time and energy to helping others that they might get strong in the Lord and established in the faith, only to see them fall by the wayside and go back to their lives of sin. Hurts me every time I see that happen. Now I just got to keep pressing on. But nonetheless, when I see a Christian fall, when I hear of a pastor quitting the ministry, when I see a Christian that's lived for God for years just kind of throw in the towel and, and give up, it breaks my heart. Because to me, it's just another victory for the devil. Add to that the heartache of seeing Christians just simply give up and drop out of church. Or marriage, a marriage imploded. It makes you sometimes discouraged. A third reason why Christians get weary in well-doing is worrying about tomorrow. This is one of the main things that the enemy uses against us. Rather than focus, focusing on just getting through today, rather than facing today's battles and dealing with today's trials, 
They allow themselves to get overwhelmed. And they end up worrying about things that may never come to pass. Bills. Problems with their children. Problems at their job. It starts stacking up like a huge pile. And when you start looking at all those things that could be, that might be, it can sometimes overwhelm you. Things that are out of our control that we must put into God's hand because we can't change tomorrow. Why worry about things you can't change? Just give it to God. Jesus said in Matthew 6, 34, Take therefore no thought for tomorrow, for tomorrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. In other words, don't worry about tomorrow. Just be concerned about today. Amen. Yesterday's gone. It's already in the past. We got no guarantee about tomorrow, so let's just focus on today. Praise God. To allow ourselves to worry is to lack faith. And without faith, we can't please God or even live for God. Number four, the devil causes us to be weary in well-doing. He is and always will be the accuser of the brethren. He will remind us of our past failures, our mistakes. He'll continually try to point out our shortcomings and our weaknesses. Tell me what I don't know. He'll fill our hearts with guilt when we fail God in some way. He'll tell us what lousy Christians we are, that we're wasting our time, that no one cares. And if you listen to his lies and accusations long enough, it'll cause you to be weary and well-doing. You talk to those that have quit on God. They got it in their head that they were wasting their time, that uh, nobody cared about them, whatever it may be. They started listening to that voice of the devil. And soon it became their own voice. And after a while, they just threw in the towel. Four examples of how believers become weary and well-doing. And each one of us here today can come up with several others, other ways that we just get weary and well-doing. The point is this. You can love God. You can have a heartfelt desire to live for Him and to serve Him. And still find yourself getting weary in well-doing. So the question before us is, how do we overcome weariness? First, let me briefly address this matter of weariness in the flesh. I say briefly because weariness is the flesh is a physical problem. And there are certain things we can do to correct this problem. Number one, get rest. You've got to get your rest. We all get tired. Even the Lord Jesus got tired. There's no getting around it. And all we can do is get rest when we need it. Get a good night's sleep. Take a vacation. Rest your tired bodies when you get weary. I've been working a full-time job ever since I've been in the ministry. And if, I, if I'm not careful, it could burn me out. Going to work tonight, going to work on a Wednesday night, i got to get my rest. Because if I don't, I'll be running on empty real quick. And you won't accomplish much if you run yourself into the ground. So rest, I can't put up, I can't put up, say enough about how important it is to get our rest. There are days where I'm trying to rest and it seems like the devil's just got the phone ring, someone knocking at the door, a dog's barking. Just distractions to try to keep me from it. I gotta get through it. Part of the problem is this. When we run around with no schedule or game plan, no sense of priorities, making unnecessary trips, foolish use of our time, we're like a dog chasing its tail. I try to make a list every day of what I have to do, and I break it down into priorities. Stuff that I, I just absolutely have to take care of. Stuff that I'd like to get to, but that can wait till tomorrow, and then just stuff on my list that I need to get around to. It's hard to get rest when you're gallivanting around or staying up late, and then you wonder why you're always tired. The Bible says to redeem the time because the days are evil, Ephesians 5, 16. And we are told in Psalm 90, verse 12, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. We got we to gotta ask God to teach us to number our days. Otherwise, the days will slip by us and we find out we're missing church because we got to catch up on stuff we didn't get to during the week. We need time to recharge our batteries and renew our hearts. God set aside Sundays as a day of rest. Now, I know it doesn't always work out that day, especially when you've only got weekends to take care of things. But as much as possible, we should rest up on Sundays. 
I try to get whatever shopping and things I gotta do done during the week so that Sundays I can just rest in the Lord. Doesn't mean missing church, but cutting out unnecessary errands. Number two, we need to physically, physically take care of ourselves. 1 Corinthians 6.20 What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own? And again in 1 Corinthians 3.16 Know ye not that you are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? Our bodies are the temple of God. And if you're saved, God now lives inside you. And it's our duty and our responsibility to keep these temples clean and undefiled. I hit that real hard this morning about how they had to clean out the house of God and spiritually we need to keep these temples clean. Drugs, booze, cigarettes, junk food, gluttony, pornography, it's all bad for you and it will all affect you. And if the abuse continues for too long, it can end up wrecking your life. There are people that have a heart for God. Unfortunately, they're stuffing that body with all kind of junk and they, their heart gives out. Or they have a stroke. Or they physically can't get around like they used to. No telling what damage was done to our bodies before we got saved. Many of us got saved later in life. So all the running around, all the stuff we were doing, it does take its toll. Now God can heal you if too much damage has been done. But once we get saved, we got to clean up our act physically and start using wisdom and taking care of these bodies. This is all we got till we get them glorified bodies in heaven. How old are you, Brother Everett? God bless you, brother. Still got his hair. Still going for the Lord. I like that. Mrs. Smith, she's getting a little shaky in her walk, but 90-something years old, she's still going for the Lord. I praise God for that. Oh, Mrs. Right. Raymond hit 100. She hit 100, wasn't it? 101. 101. Couldn't hear it worth a lick without her hearing aid, but I'm telling you what, she was still going for God. Mine was sharp as a tack. Got to take care of your bodies. When you abuse your bodies, when you don't take care of yourself, it will wear you out. Here's the thing. When you get saved, spiritually God gives you a new heart, a fresh start. But until we get to heaven... We must do all we can to take care of these bodies of clay. These two adjustments will help you overcome any physical weariness. But let me add one more thought concerning this kind of weariness. There is also a mental aspect to physical weariness. Earlier I mentioned, uh, well I didn't mention it, Proverbs 23, 7. As he thinketh in his heart, so is he. Our mental condition has a lot to do with how we hold up physically. For example... If you keep saying to yourself, oh, I'm so tired, I'm so tired, I'm so tired. I'm so exhausted, I'm so worn out. Negative comments will begin to affect you. Just like someone that keeps telling himself, man, I'm so stupid, I'm so stupid. You keep telling yourself that, after a while you're going to believe it. Dwelling on negativity will take its toll on your body physically. People die for no apparent reason. They just lose hope. They get discouraged. They get depressed. And they just die for no reason. On the other hand, there are people that have overcome incredible hardships and severe handicaps because they never lose faith. They never lost faith. They never gave up hope. They were determined to overcome the obstacle that stood before them. Do they hurt? Yeah, they hurt. But they've overcome it through God. So that's the other side of it, is that if we can keep a positive outlook, just keep positive in the Lord. There are days when it, during the winter when it's cold and it's dark and it's gray and it's dreary. I have myself a little pity party and a flood of negative thoughts just fill my head and I'm no good for anybody until I can literally shake it off and re, reboot my mind to think of heavenly things and godly things. Notice what our opening passage declares. For in due season, we shall reap if we faint not. The word faint as it's used here doesn't mean to pass out. It means to quit, to give up, to lose hope, to lose faith. Long before someone quits a job or walks out on a marriage or drops out of church, they're already thinking about it, rolling a thought around in their minds. 
And if we don't protect our minds and guard our thoughts, it will affect us spiritually. We've got to learn to rebuke those thoughts. When the devil starts getting you to think about quitting church, when he starts getting you to think and go back to your life of sin, when he starts putting thoughts in your head that you're missing out on life, that life's passing you by, you need to rebuke those thoughts. The Bible says, bring every thought into captivity. Cast out every wicked and ungodly thought. In the name of Jesus, I rebuke that thought. Amen. That's where knowing Scripture comes in handy. Because as you memorize Scripture verses, you can use those verses to your advantage. One of the things that set the Apostle Paul apart from others was his determination, his single-mindedness. When he was persecuting the church, he was so focused on it that he was wreaking havoc because that was his mission. Then when he became a Christian, the thought of quitting never entered his mind. It was not an option in his mindset. He would not tolerate negativity, murmuring, complaining. He was single-minded in his pursuit of God. And lastly, he would shut down any discouraging thoughts within his mind. And that's the only way to keep our minds and bodies strong. There was this runner, Steve Prefontaine, a long-distance runner. And he wasn't the fastest guy, but this guy won all kinds of races, broke all kinds of records. And they asked him, what's, what's the secret to your success? He says, I just got a greater threshold of pain. When everybody else starts hurting, and the thought of just dropping out or quitting comes over them, he says, I just push hard. I just push hard. And he's on to something there. Yeah. You're going to have things come your way. Physical problems. Heartache that you got to deal with. Things that are just going to slow you down. And you've got to determine to get past that os obstacle. You've got to determine that nothing or no one's going to slow you down for the glory of God. Matthew 26, 41 declares, Watch and pray that you enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And therein is the root of the problem. We've got a heart desire to serve God, otherwise we wouldn't be here on a sunny night. But this stinking flesh is weak. This flesh would rather sit on the couch and channel certain. Rather than read our Bibles, this flesh would rather just get a bucket of chicken and just stuff our faces. Rather than pray, this body of flesh wants to get 20 weeks somewhere. So we got to let our bodies know who's calling the shots, and it's God. we got to discipline our bodies. We're going to church today, and we might go to church tonight. And we're going to spend some time in prayer. And I don't care what's on TV tonight. I need to get into the Word. I need to spend some time in the Word. Having looked at overcoming physical weariness, I want to focus our attention on how to come weariness and well-doing. Number one, we must see God at work in the little things. You read the Bible, and many times God is working in this powerful, supernatural way with magnificent displays of power like parting the Red Sea and bringing the plagues upon Egypt, feeding 5,000 people. God can still do those things, and God will work in mighty ways. But oftentimes, in our lives, He'll work in quiet ways. And it's the little things of life that we sometimes miss or take for granted. I've been trying to train myself to just see God in everything. Little things that we overlook because we're just so focused on our problems, or because we're, we're just running so fast in life. People say to God, does God still do miracles every day? Unfortunately, we miss them so often. Boy, I'm still thinking about that car accident, that head-on car accident that I missed. You don't think that was a miracle? Oh, yeah. I could have been pushing up daisies right now. I just went down the road just praising God for sparing me. And that no one else got seriously hurt. Every day, ask God to open up your eyes, to clear your spiritual vision. So that you can see. Sometimes God will answer a prayer. And it's not until a day later we think, my goodness, I was praying about that very thing. Rebecca was uh, telling me about some uh, one of her friends that she was just talking about, praying for. And this uh, girl contacted her. 
Tell her she, she's missing something in her life. She needs to find a church. She needs to get right with God. That was an answer to prayer. It was a little thing that could have easily been overlooked. God's hand of blessing is so often upon our lives and we just don't see it. That's why it's so important to take time to reflect on the goodness of God. Take time to count your blessings, name them one by one, because if not, you'll overlook a whole lot. Here's the thing. When we fail to see God at work in the little things of life, it's very easy to get discouraged and become weary in well-doing. Got a small crowd tonight. I could easily say, oh, man, what's the point? Where is everybody? But you know what? I thank God for the visitors we had this morning, for the good crowd we had this morning, and that maybe some of that crowd will start filtering into tonight, night services. I count my blessings for that. Number two, stay busy for God. If there is one area where new Christians are dropping the ball, it's not staying busy for God. Begin with church attendance. Spiritually, they've got one foot in church and the other foot is halfway out the door. And if they don't settle in to the routine of church, they'll soon grow weary of it. Start looking at their watch, start getting antsy. It's like someone trying to lose weight. They may not see any immediate weight loss, and they get discouraged that the weight's not coming off. But part of the problem is their commitment to working out and eating right. Without commitment, there can be no gains. And spiritually, the same thing holds true. Some people have an attitude like, well, I'll come to church if God blesses me. Well, he will. But sometimes God wants you to just settle in, not just show up, expect him to drop a blessing in your lap and then not be seen again until you need another blessing from God. It's not how it works. There must be a commitment to every aspect of life, to our job, to our relationships, to our marriages, to our walk with God. Without a commitment, we're just kind of going through the motions, up and down, in and out. Our opening passage in Galatians uses a farming term to illustrate the need for patience and perseverance and well-doing. Let's look at it again. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. When a farmer plows his field and plants his seed, he then waits for rain. This is a slow process. It takes him some days to turn over that field. Then he has to go about planting those seeds. Then he's got to wait for the rain. And it might be months before he sees any signs of growth. And when he does, it's just a little seedling popping up like this, something you can hardly see. It will be months before his crops are ready to be harvested. That's a long time. That's why the Bible uses so much farming illustrations about flowers and trees and things like that. All the work that he put into it with no immediate returns, how does he deal with that? How does a farmer deal with it? He plants his seeds in the springtime, and he ain't going to see nothing until September or whatever. How does he deal with it? By keeping busy. Tending to his farm animals, repairing his equipment, fixing his barns, daily chores that must get done. Every once in a while goes over and looks at his, at his uh, crops, see how they're coming along, and then gets right back into some other project. We as Christians have to have the same attitude. Stay busy for God. Stay busy for God. Number three. To overcome being weary and well-doing, we got to toughen up. We are called to be volunteers in the Lord's army, <clears throat> soldiers in the army of God. And if we're going to call ourselves soldiers, then we got to toughen up. Churches today are filled with a lot of soft Christians. It doesn't take much to rattle their cage. Some of them have no work ethic. <clears throat> a guy that came to our church one time wanted to do something. He said, if I knew that it was going to take work, I, I wouldn't have volunteered for it. Well, there you go. No tolerance for pain or hardships, no staying power, no grit, no determination, no guts. First time there's a bump in the road of their feathers getting ruffled, they're gone. Didn't take much. When trials come, we got to batten down the hatches and 
toughen up, ride out the storms of life. God will give you all the strength you need to get through it. But we have a part of it. We got to, my pastor used to always say, keep a, have a rhino's hide, have a tough outer skin so that all the stuff that comes out against you bounces off and keep your heart tender. He's telling it right. Keep your heart tender. But develop a thick skin because people will hurt you. People will say things against you. Life will throw some real zingers at you. And you've just got to toughen up. I mentioned this morning that article. That school. Teachers are no longer allowed to write in red ink because red ink is mean. And if teachers grade papers, they've got to write something positive in there because too much take... In, too much negative stuff will, will, will offend these young minds. Get out of here. That's crazy. If you've ever played sports, you know that these coaches, they'll start yelling, motivating you, getting you out of their first gear. And you might not like it, but boy, it gets you, it's your engine going. And we sometimes need that. We need preaching that's going to just jump start our Christian walk. That'll stir up the fires of our heart once again. I can't take that, that Lily white tight, soft preaching. It just, it just puts me to sleep. Candy coat and everything because you don't want to step on anybody's toes. I just can't take that kind of preaching. If I'm going to take the time to come out to church, rev me up, stir me up, get me going for God. Yeah. We've got to toughen up spiritually. While, rather than wearing our hearts on our sleeve, being easily offended, we must learn to shake it off and keep on going. I mean, Jesus was our example. They hated him without cause everywhere he went. He faced persecution. What if we would have said, that's it, I'm done. You're on your own, see you later. He went back to his hometown of Nazareth, a place where everybody knew him, a place that should have embraced him, and he marveled at their unbelief. It probably hurt, but he just shook it off and went on to the next town. Jesus told the disciples, when you go to a town and share the gospel, if they don't want to receive it, just shake off the dust and keep on going. And I find myself doing that sometimes. If somebody hurts me or does something wrong, physically, I just go like this. I'm going to be all right, Lord. I'm just going to shake the dust off and keep on going. That's what we got to do. Once you develop a quitter's mentality, you'll find yourself quitting in all areas of your life. Quitting your job, quitting your marriage, quitting on your kids, quitting on church and everything else, just quitting. And that's not a good place to be. We've got to develop some stickability. If you know where God wants you to be, hopefully it's here, and you're doing what he wants you to do, then dig in deep. Determine that nothing's going nothing's to take you away from what God's called you to do. The reality of the situation is this. Every day that we get up, we have a choice to make. We can either start the day wallowing in self-pity, complaining about how unfair life is, how hard life is, or we can suck it up and determine within our heart that nothing's going to stop us from God. That we're just going to give it to God and not worry about where the chips may fall. Number four, to overcome weariness and well-doing, we must put on spiritual blinders. One of the things that causes us to stumble, to get weary in the way, is worrying about what others are doing for God. If it seems like they're being used in a greater way than we are, that they're being blessed, it can cause resentment in your soul. I have no interest in what other churches are doing, how many people they're running. Because if I start hearing, man, you should hear what's going on at that other church down the street, it can make me start feeling like, well, why isn't God blessing us here? What do they got that we don't got? So I don't worry about what this pastor's doing or what that pastor's doing. I don't even like to hear about it. I'm happy for them. God bless them. I'm just concerned about what's going on here. Amen. If you're actively serving God and you notice that others aren't doing nothing for God, it can cause you to become a finger pointer. Worrying more about what others. What about him? What about, what about this one? What about that one? 